you so much, choir. Thank you so much. If you have your Bibles, open them to uh, Luke chapter 1. I'm going to break my rule that I should never break. I, I'm going to tell you that I have prepared for a short sermon. Are y'all good with that? <laughs> Problem is, is that usually when I say that, it goes long. But uh, let's see if I can do what I'm supposed to do. When I was thinking about Mother's Day, usually you try to think about uh, this great mom in the Bible that we could kind of uh, make as our goal to be like them. But we're in a series called God Pleasers because we in our life want to be uh, uh, people that please God. And uh, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says that it is impossible to please God without faith. And he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we need to look in our lives at the things that, that we can do to say, Lord, I, I love you, and I know that you're God, and I'm not, and I'll let, I'm going to allow you to be God. But Lord, as I come after you and did diligently seek you, I know and I believe and I trust that you will reward me. Now, in the, in the thoughts of this, I, I began to think about all the things that God has planned in our lives and the greatest thing that all of us could ever do is to understand and know and come to find out that that he is God and we are not and, and seek to be obedient to everything that he places before us to do find Christ as Savior and Lord and, and everything is great and wonderful after that so when I was thinking about this I thought of a couple because today I really want to focus on partners in faith or really partners in faithfulness. And when I began thinking about that, the Lord brought me to Mary and Joseph. And this is not a normal sermon that you would hear in December, but it is part of the passage that you would normally hear around the Christmas time. So if you have your Bible in Luke chapter 1, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word? Luke chapter 1 verse 26 says, Now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled. I believe that's an understatement. Troubled at his saying and considered what matter of greeting this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, she understood exactly what he was saying. She said, how can this be, since I do not know a man? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. With God, nothing will be impossible. Let's pray. Now, Father, I pray that you add your blessing to your word. I thank you for loving us enough to send Jesus. I thank you for the faithfulness of Mary and Joseph when you spoke to them and how they accepted your will, the task, the calling that you placed upon their life, and how they put you first in all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. When I began thinking about this, I began thinking about the time I met my wife and sitting in church. And I was at that particular church for a funeral. I was just a visitor. I was sitting in the back. Uh, my niece 
who is uh, eight years younger than I am, was sitting beside me. And uh, though she was young, she didn't look young. Can y'all y'all understand what I'm talking about? And she was my niece, and uh, we were always very close. And I put my arm around her just like you do sitting in church. That's kind of the man's way of propping up in his arm. And my, I saw, but I noticed there was a girl in the choir. Now, I know I should have been listening to the sermon. But I was noticing this woman in the choir, and she was sitting on the front row. My mom was sitting behind her in the second row in the choir. And I thought to myself, amen, amen, and amen. <laughs> and that was the first time I laid eyes on my wife. And, and if I was a smart fellow, I would have pursued her even then, but it, it took some time, and it was the, the plans that God had for our life. But when, when we started dating, I won't tell you how long we dated because the parents would get on to me, but it wasn't very long, and we were engaged, and what, six, seven months later, we were married, and we had plans, and I remember all the times that we were talking about the things that we would do. I was a financial planner in that day, and, and, and but I also had already received God's call in my life that I was going to be a pastor, so here I am asking this woman to come along beside me and walk through, and really not knowing where we would go, not knowing what we would, all the things that we would be doing. Because when God calls and you say yes to that, then you'll do whatever, whenever, however, to whoever, because that is the calling that's upon your life. But really, that's not just for a pastor's life. That's for anybody's life. Because when you are seeking out God's will in your life, you will do whatever, whenever, however, to whoever. You, you will say, here am I, Lord, send me. I am grateful, oh, so very grateful to know you. But, but we still had our plans, too. We planned the wedding. We planned the honeymoon. We planned, well, I planned the honeymoon. We planned all of these things and, and what we would do. And, and, and we, we talked about children's names before we even uh, had a child. And, and we, we had all these plans. And it was no different for Mary and Joseph. Their, their parents came together and bartered out a deal. Y'all good with uh, parents choosing who you're going to marry? <laughs> no one under 30 said a thing right there. <clears throat> but it was uh, the betrothal process, the marriage process. It wasn't just, hey, let's go get hitched and running down to the, the local synagogue and finding some rabbi, any rabbi will do, and, and just getting married. There was a first church I pastored. There was this couple, and they told me, they said when they got married, they they... He, they, she got it, he drove to her house, she got in his A model Ford and drove to the preacher's house, honked the horn. The preacher came to the vehicle. They said, this is, we want you to marry us. He said, well, come on in the house. And they said, no, we just want you to marry us right there. So he went and got his Bible and married them sitting in the vehicle. Come, this is the truth. He reached in his pocket, gave the preacher some money. Well, amen for that. And <laughs> they backed up and went on the honeymoon. Now, that's short-range planning. That's not the way it was with Mary and Joseph. Most likely, Mary, y'all parents do this real quick. Most likely, she was a young teenager, maybe even 15. Some theologians say maybe even 13 or 14, but I'm just not going to believe that. I'm going to choose to, but I don't know how she was. I didn't, I've never had to car a couple before I married them to find out if they were old enough. We just uh, meet for 10 weeks when I marry somebody. I make them go through 10 weeks of counseling. And in a certain way, that's kind of what they did. It was a, a time of setting yourself apart, a time of bridal showers, a time of courting, a time when, when he would come to her house. Families would meet together. There would be uh, meals and introductions to the extended family. And can you imagine what was going through Mary's mind when she saw him? I wonder if her heart was pitter patter. I wonder what Joseph thought when he looked at her for the first time. Did he give her a, a holy hug a hug? I don't know. I guarantee he checked out the mother in law that looked like a 20 or 30 years. Amen. Wanted to know if there was hope, I guess. I don't know. 
but their life was about dreams and preparations and plans and meeting and talking. And he probably thought, man, she's cute. And went home and as the normal thing of the day, he began to build on a room to the house that they had because the woman would come and live with the man. The man would live with families. Sometimes there would be three or four generations in one uh, home compound. But you would want to have your own place there, and he would begin preparing that. And don't you know that it probably wasn't a, a hard thing for him to do? He thought, yes, we'll have the bed here, and, and we'll put the baby beds over here, and, and planned all these things out, and probably had a whistle uh, to, his, to, his, to his lips, and a uh, a steadiness to his walk and he thought how good this is going to be and then God showed up well actually God sent an angel Gabriel he had already been messing up with Elizabeth and Zacharias life John the Baptist was coming with Elizabeth God had showed himself strong and God, God did it in the most remarkable way so that Later on, Mary would say, well, I don't guess mine is so remarkable, but yes, it is. And, and understand what it was like in, in, in verse 27. It says uh, that this girl, Mary, was a virgin engaged or betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. So she is a virgin. When this angel speaks and says, rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. What in the world does that mean? Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. Well, that's good. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And then she starts hearing about him, and she's like, hold on. Whoa, what? Lord, I didn't ask for this. I didn't, this is not in the plans that, that Joseph and I had. We're going to just live here in Nazareth and I'm, I'm going to walk my child down to synagogue school and, and, and we'll, just, we'll just have the most wonderful family gathering. God says, amen, amen. But you don't understand. I have plans for your life. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 said that when we were in the womb, God knew us. And goes on to say that he sanctified us. He had a plan for us that he separated us to. He goes on to say that, that this man will, this Jeremiah would be a prophet unto God, ordained. In other words, God knew you. He gave you your personality. He knew when you would be born because he's the God who knows all. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God who sits on the throne in heaven knows everything. Yeah. Stevens. Mom was 17 when she got married. Dad was 20. World War II beginning, right? The days of World War II had, had just already begun. And, and my dad left my mom pregnant when he went overseas. Matter of fact, I'm the end of the line. I'm the accident that was in her plan. You could look through all the photo albums and there would be hundreds and hundreds of pictures of him. We found two of me. <laughs> Truth. 
And one of those two was I was in the background of my sister's birthday party. <laughs> they were tired when I came around. And yet God had a calling on my life. I remember when I was seven and I was in the backyard and a cousin was there and was going through some times of distraught and I found myself ministering, a seven-year-old ministering to an older cousin and the voice of God, I wasn't even saved yet, but the voice of God said to me, this is what you're going to do in your life. By the way, I didn't remember that when I was going to high school and college. I wish I had. I wish I could have planned things a little bit better. But yet God knew what he was doing from the beginning. The point was not that God had plans for Mary and Joseph. The plans are when God speaks, when God interrupts, when God hijacks them from their plans and, and shares with him his plans, would they say yes? And it says here at the end, verse 38, Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And she really wasn't sure all that that meant, but she knew it was God. Take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 1. Now it's going to get interesting. Because it's one thing for Mary to see the angel of the Lord and to hear his words. What are you going to say to Joseph? Uh-oh. And in Matthew 1, verse 18, the Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. I bet that was an awkward conversation. what it says verse 20 while he thought about these things and I'm sure he could hardly think about anything else behold an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying Joseph son of David do not be afraid to take Mary your wife did you hear that to not 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 doesn't say to take Mary as your wife the betrothal process had already begun. They were each other. What he was going to have to do was literally divorce her, annul this thing. He says, no, 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 don't be afraid. He said, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And it goes on to say, this is, this is what Isaiah told us was going to happen. But I wonder what it was like when, I think he went to see Mary pretty quick, didn't she, Mark? 
I believe he went in and the parents probably were wondering what in the world is going to happen. And he sits down and looks at her, stares in the face, and says, ah, ah, I need to know that. I need to know that. Trust me. I know you're going to say something to my kid. As a matter of fact, we may not have chose this path, but God has chosen it for us. Honey, To give them unto the Lord and leave it there. To say, Lord, I know there's going to be a change of plans, maybe once, maybe twice, maybe a hundred times. But Lord, I trust you and I will follow you. Being faithful. How many of you have had plans to change? A car wreck, a phone call, a doctor. Some of you are divorced. Some of you are the victim of divorce. You had nothing to do with it. It just happened. Some of you, your mate left early. Some of you, heaven is a better place, but you're still having to walk this path of God's will for you. It's not your time yet, and you're still having to walk it out. Some of you thought you had everything perfectly put together, and yet God said, Because when God changes a plan, when God throws up the red light, are you going to be angry with God? Many are. Do your dreams, are your dreams his dreams? Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans for good, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I guarantee you, Joseph was wanting to, to take care of this, do it in the right way, but to take care of this. But yet, something else happens. We make decisions, but are we really going to allow him to do what's good and right and best? Will we, will, will we be open to God's work in our life? you to trust him when you're forever, but he wants you to trust him with your today. He wants you to understand that he can do all things. With God, nothing is impossible. Do you believe that? And yet, there are so many people who say that they're Christian, who say that they have made a covenant commitment to him, but they live their life, can I say it, their own way. Lord, if there's any way this cup can pass for me, he, he, 
believe that every day he saw Jesus carrying him around as a young child, feeding him, Jesus following behind him. Every day he saw an opportunity, an opportunity to pour into the Son of God. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and understanding. So when he took off the robes of glory and came down here, he became man. He had his seal pinned. So there were things that he would seal for the first time in all eternity. Joseph and Mary would be there with him, faithfully loved, helpless guys. Can I just say I am grateful that I believe this is Brian's way of saying it. I'm very grateful that Mary and Joseph walked hand in hand together. I am very grateful that that the two of them when, when they made decisions they said honey this may be what we want to do but we've got to do what's best for him that they truly did love God and love others and they truly did what was good and right they were devoted to the task that God had placed before them and they remained loyal and true every step of the way Lastly, let me say this. They were living for something bigger than themselves. <laughs> I don't want the best to be upon me. Parents, y'all know what I'm saying when I say, I want more for my children. This bothers me. 